I just thought that I would introduce briefly myself. Uh, so I'm Lucrezia uh, or Lucretia, you can go for either pronunciations. And uh, um, I am a PhD candidate here at Warwick and I'm so glad to have this opportunity. Um, and I usually work on Horace's lyric and uh, sort of the point of contact with tragedy. But of course, uh, I'm really, really interested in the politics of the late Republic because of course they determine a lot of what comes next. And uh, uh, so I would say, of course, if you have any questions, just, you know, feel free to, yeah, write them in the chat or raise your hands. Uh, meanwhile, oh, that's a good question first. Okay, good, we'll start with that. Uh, so I uh, know that Giles, he's asking the attitudes of a few individuals rather than a flawed system of government led to the downfall of the rest publica. What do you think? Well, um, yeah, this is, you know, of course, as in, as in everything, when you look at such a form of government, like, well, the Roman Republic, uh, it's um, something that, of course, it's a complex system. So I think like, you can't really reduce maybe to few people, but certainly the fact that uh, sort of in, well, uh, in Roman Republic, uh, like, exactly few personalities started to have a sort of uh, interest towards the, um, you know, the kind of, um, well, the, the, the power and uh, uh, the control of the state. Of course, it's something that surely didn't play uh, towards, you know, the, the best for the system. And actually on this, I can share my screen uh, as I think I wanted to show you something uh, yeah, sorry, just I'm trying not to uh, make anything look bad. I hope everyone can see this. Um, but in any case, uh, on, on these specific questions, uh, you know, well, if we look at here, these were just some extra text I prepare uh, to show you. So if we look where it is a Sallust, especially, sorry, I'm just trying to find uh, the exact point where it says that. But basically, um, yeah, sorry, here. Uh, so basically he, of course, uh, he makes a general, more general discourse on the uh, sort of the lust for money and the lust for power. But of course, that's exactly uh, what uh, probably it is meant when we look at certain individuals. Of course, we have individuals such as, well, Caesar most famously, or, uh, you know, gradually Antony, uh, you know, if we think of course of the, sort of the the escalation of the of the different civil wars until uh, the rise of Augustus, we know that surely uh, there was a new sort of uh, um, desire for power and, and, and for wealth. And of course, all of this, if we look at sort of Salus theorem, as it is called, is because after the, well, because of course it's, uh, there are several historical reasons contributing, but what the contemporaries thought and what Sallust especially picked up on was the fact that after the Carthaginian War, you have this, uh, of course, new piece of the, uh, of the Roman dominions. And, and of course, the Roman uh, you know, power starts to be more stable, it's peaceful. And of course, in these circumstances, uh, you know, a city flourishes. And of course, with the flourishing comes also the power, the wealth, and all of this, according to kind of the moralistic reading of the time, uh, brought to the fact that a few men at some point, as, as uh, here he says, um, a few powerful men um, to whose influence the majority had acceded were aiming at domination under the honorable name of the Senate and the plebs. So of course, there is surely that, the contribution of course of, you know, single leading personalities that start sort of coming out of maybe the Senate and, you know, the bigger uh, uh, leading group, if that's um, sort of that makes sense. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to sh stop the sharing because I can't see any other questions and I don't want to um, sort of uh, feel. Uh, I don't know if that replied to your questions. Maybe if you want, Giles, I can sort of uh, unmute oh, you. Oh, think. that's very helpful. Yeah, yes, the, okay. um, especially if you know, Salah Sala says quite directly, a few powerful men, doesn't he? So that's really yeah. helpful. Um, just um, one other question I have is, um, does the modern scholarship tend to favour one side of this question or the other? So some scholars uh, emphasise individuals, whereas other scholars favour the, the system of government, or does it not really work that way? 
Well, I think you can sort of in scholarship, as far as I know, of course, there are both. <laughs> I'm sure there will be both the, uh, the opinions. And of course, what I usually recommend uh, is to sort of try and, you know, read, read both, especially, I guess, um, or this is what I, at least I found out in my sort of very short experience of teaching. It's better to, you know, kind of try to merge the two explanations together and, you know, make people see that both, both views are possible uh, in terms, also in terms of scholarship. I'm, I'm sure scholars have, um, you know, spoke about mm. uh, both these um, positions. One thing that our students are asked to do is to refer to modern scholarship. So I just wondered if you could just pick out like a, one or two names of sort of up-to-date uh, writers on the fall of the Republic who, who we might look at or yeah, um, um, quote. Yeah, no, actually, uh, this is uh, rather interesting. Uh, well, first of all, the uh, sort of, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to look at the uh, essay that was well, I, was on the website attached to my presentation. Well, that comes from a very useful uh, work uh, by Breed, Damon and Rossi. I can actually uh, easily, you know, uh, make sure that you get those titles later but basically the title is Citizens of Discord, Rome and its Civil Wars. And that's a very helpful analysis, also enriched by um, numerous texts and sort of, because I, I prefer, you know, when uh, it's difficult sometimes, of course, to get a clear idea, but I guess when you always go back to text and you pick readings that have a very strong sort of philological uh, sort of basis, it's much more helpful because it gives you a much wider idea of actually the, the situation. So that's a very good book and it's from 2010. Uh, so I would say that's good. Also, I'm um, uh, just looking for, sorry, just I have it in my database. So I'm, I'm just opening Zotero to look at it. Uh, but I think it's by Gourval uh, and it's called Actium and Augustus the politics and emotions of civil war that's slightly early 1995 but that's also a very um helpful tool in in defining you know the kind of the uh so the, the period and, and what was going on in there um, basically well the the sort of my video was about the end of the republic and i sort of proposed uh first of all like a reflection on the historical context of the late republic so um, I've looked in particular, as I was saying to Giles before, to Wiseman 2010, which is a very helpful piece of scholarship on sort of reasoning on the causes of civil war and of the fall of the, of course, of the Republic. And I started by looking, of course, at the, pers of the Augustan perspective, so the perspective from poets like uh, Virgil, like Horace, and of course there I, uh, so they will, they depict the civil war and the whole period of the fall of the Republic as, you know, an ominous period where uh, of course, the civil war becomes this sort of sin, almost this divine punishment because the because of the immorality of the Roman people. So, um, of course, that's um, that's something that that's what remained in the poetic experience. But um, as we go well back, actually, to the late Republican period and to what these authors thought, uh, I sort of shown how, well, Varro in the Vita Populi Romani, Varro, of course, is a polymath of the period. He wrote about anything, uh, but of course, we are left just with few fragments, sadly enough. And uh, well, of course, he describes the um, Roman uh, city, the Roman sort of system has bicipitas, so uh, two-headed, a two-headed citizen body. So um, I guess that's the starting point, of course, uh, how, how we come to this. And of course, well, Varro, think the reason why this two-headed state uh, happens is because of the um, Gracchi laws. Of course, the, the Gracchi laws, I'm, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with those because they're kind of very specific um, sort of uh, historical facts. But basically, uh, well, uh, the Gracchi brother, first of all, Tiberius Gracchus in 133, he uh, sort of proposed this new law about the uh, distribution of public land, which before was just sort of, uh, controlled by senators, well, he proposes to distribute this and to give part of this to smaller landowners. Um, the Senate is not happy and they manage to veto the law. Uh, and of course, this order follows during which Tiberius is killed. Um, 10 years later, 122 BC, uh, his brother Gaius Gracchus tries to, well, proposes the same law in addition with a judicial reform for which 
also some juridical court, uh, courts were to be reformed and made of knights rather than senators. So again, two, two measures that were kind of uh, hitting in some way, striking in some way the, uh, the Senate class. So of course, as a result of this, again, Gaius Gracchus will, will die in the disorders following uh, his proposal, although his laws will be actually applied. So, um, you know, they, they were successful in the end. And I pointed at Florus, uh, who is an historian, a later historian. He's not, of course, from the late Republic, but we know that he modeled himself probably on Varro himself. Um, and, uh, and of course, again, he sort of sees in the Gracchi law, uh, laws the, the sort of the problem uh, of the um, end of the Republic, as in sort of the one of the uh, problems that generated uh, the civil wars. But basically, uh, then I passed on to quote uh, some other historians, Dionysus, Appian, Valerius. These all probably referred back again to uh, Republican sources. So that's why we consider them, as in, I consider them as a sort of uh, saying something about the late Republic. So um, Appian says, well, basically it was the whole violence that erupted with Tiberius Gracchus's uh, legislation and Valais Perticulus similarly sort of looked at that violence as kind of the responsible, the starting point of all the entering violence. Um, then of course we come to Cicero, which is I guess the, the big uh, the big character in, in this period. Uh, and he too looks at Tiberius Gracchus as somehow sort of again the violence, the, the civic unrest that you know sort of uh, uh, burst out that again is the cause for him Although he recognized that, of course, the uh, legislation was the problematic part under the political point of view. Um, so what we got is two main poles, basically. Someone, some people think, of course, it's, well, um, the whole violence and the whole violence issue starting, let's say, from, from Tiberius Gracchus's murder. And then uh, on the other pole, there is the, uh, the whole uh, laws Problems. So the fact that the both the Lex Frumentari and the Lex Judiciaria are, um, you know, something that uh, comes to to um, to generate all of this. I can see there is a question, so I can stop here. Um, so Jody Reynolds, uh, feel free, of course, to uh, show yourself or respond to me uh, in any way. So I'm going to read the uh, question out loud. What do you think about Sulla? Does he generally try to help stabilize the Republic or does he not really care about anything but himself and his own position? Uh, hi, hi, Johnny, I can see that you, uh, I can see you, so hi. Um, so I think, you know, uh, with these characters, it's always so difficult to, um, you know, determine what they're doing because you can say the same, but you can say for Sulla this, but also you can say for Caesar, what are they doing? What, you know, what are they trying to achieve? I, I do agree with you. Um, but I would say, well, Silla, after all, he, um, you know, kind of, uh, well, renounced at some point at uh, all his powers. So I would say that, you know, that's a big step as in, that's something that you know, tells you that probably he was, <laughs> he, he was meaning well. But of course, we, we can't say to what extent uh, this, is, this is true. Um, it is also true when you say, well, who does not, yeah, um, I'm thinking also about Caesar, of course, well, he, he got killed before he could do anything really, right? So we can't, again, that's, you know, that's something that we can't really um, tell. Uh, but I, again, I do invite you to have a look at the, um, uh, at the uh, book that you can find also in the chat here, uh, The Citizens of Discord, because there is a chapter on Sulla which might be helpful. And, you know, at least in finding out, although it's such, it's such a difficult period because, uh, you know, you have all this, you know, you have two faces of the problem all the time and it's difficult to see. Uh, and, and surely, yeah, it's, it's very complicated, I, I would say, yeah. as far as I, as I know. But yeah, yeah. is my, because um, I'm actually a history teacher, but my history students are doing the Fall of the Republic for their coursework. So they're debating the Sulla to blame or was Caesar to blame and the, yeah, yeah. It's, quite, it's, it's an interesting debate for them to get the teeth into. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, exactly. I think it's it, it's a very fruitful one, especially in terms of 
uh, rhetorical strategies and all, all of that, I think. Uh, there is also a very recent book, uh, which is a more of a popular book rather than a scholarly one. So just give me two seconds, I get the title, because I have all of them disseminated <laughs> in my laptop. Uh, but basically, this is called David Armitage, Civil Wars, A History of Ideas. I can actually type it here. Um, yeah. Was a history of ideas. And this is, again, it's a very, uh, I would say, more um, sort of, well, less academic material, but I think it's helpful also because he sort of looks at different civil wars in history, and I think it could be helpful also to give you know, some, some more contemporary perspective on this, because yeah. we always study the classics as isolated in their bubble. Uh, but I think it's helpful, especially in, in historical approaches to... Sort yeah, of, no, that'd be really interesting, that. Thank you for that. That's right. <laughs> I hope my, my answer was helpful. Yeah, no, it was definitely. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just keep going, basically. Yeah, we were saying exactly the two kind of poles, uh, of the debate, Gratkai's policies as the reasons for civil war versus the license to violence that sprang from Tiberius Gracchus's murder. And of course, the, the, poly, the, the emphasis on the policies is more something that the popularis looks at, as in, of course, that's when, you know, they uh, sort of not try to attack the Senate, but of course, clearly the as the power of the Senate get undermined, uh, the Senate sort of didn't didn't like it. So um, that's of course the popularis intake uh, as as, for, as the party that supported um, the the people. And on the other side, you have the optimates, who of course, being the party of the uh, ruling minority, they are um, defending the fact that this license to violence that spread from Tiberius Gracchus was the real responsible of the wars. And I put together some samples from Varro, from Sallust, and also from Cicero, uh, each defending their points. Um, and then, of course, uh, basically, the fact that we have exactly these divisions in society, the fact that we have also like different people defending different positions embodies, even in the writers of the period, this Bikipitis Kiwitas, this two-headed state. So that was the final closing point. Uh, and then, of course, uh, well, the the presentation then I sort of put this last half dedicating it to Cicero's beginnings because I thought I've seen that uh, from the uh, module description that the Cicero's variance is the text that uh, people are going to look at, uh, which is amazing. And I think that, yeah, um, I just saw this article by Samponaro who uh, sort of discussed effectively about this comparison between Obama's rhetoric of novelty and Cicero's. And I think that's very useful, especially within the debate of the end of the Republic. Of course, uh, Cicero's variants were what made him known to the great public and what actually started his political career. So as we go through that, um, as he, he went through that, uh, well, he clearly attacked various because of his greed, of his uh, avarice and plundering and excessive wealth and all of that, of course, can be is still part of the period's rhetoric on uh, on the critique to wealth and to greed and to avarice, and um, and of course Cicero presents himself as the man for the job, as the one who is there to uh, you know uh, help the Senate come out of the, the whole situation, um, and uh, and of course he he also uses well typical Roman qualities to actually present himself to. Uh, diligente, industria, ingenium, labor, officium, all of these are traditional ones, but of course he uses them to supply for his lack of nobilitas, of being an aristocrat and having a straightforward political career. Um, and that's the same in, in Obama, as I've shown in the latest, in the last slide, sorry. Uh, and, and I hope that was interesting. Um, oh, we have another question from Giles. Uh, of course, uh, uh, feel comparable to show yourself in case. Uh, how important was Cato in the fall of the Republic? Well, yeah, Cato is, diff it's, you know, one of those characters that, especially throughout the literary uh, depiction that we received of him, is one of those key characters because, of course, he embodied the spirit of the of the Republic. So he embodied the kind of the freedom, the libertas of the uh, Roman people. Uh, 
um, and which was, uh, you know, a fundamental part actually of the whole um, discourse. As uh, of course, what what is the problem at some point in the well in the sort of period of the fall of the republic is that uh, in some way the Senate's authority, the auctoritas that the Senate had, is undermined um, because uh, well we can we can use the whole the Wiseman thesis that of course the whole Bracken legislation and the violence and, and all of this sort of caused a um, sort of loss of trust in the Senate or as a you know as a system that would guarantee the, uh, the the Roman state to be standing there democratic and republican and all of that um, but and as I was saying so these are the auctoritas of the Senate was no longer something so steady and so confirmed and the auctoritas for what we know um, is of course this quality that is uh, somehow inherent and emanates from the from the group of the Senate and of course it's also the result of the trust that citizens put in it and the auctoritas of the Senate grants the libertas of the people so of course um, it could be interesting to look at of course how uh, you know the the freedom that Cato uh, sort of seems to embody is actually the freedom of the Roman state of the Roman people uh, as they trust uh, a, 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 you know a well-working senate basically so of course Cato is I think an important figure in making us understand what were the staples of the Roman Republican system what was the you know uh, the sort of the moral principles that uphold it, um, and uh, uh, and this is uh, important now. Now, like at, at the top of my head, uh, there is a poem by Horace where, of course, he mentions the uh, sort of uh, the, the yeah the absolute unconquered soul of Cato. So Cato becomes even in for later authors this image of unconquerability of absolute freedom and standing to, for your own principles, uh, basically, which is, as we were saying before about the whole immorality and decay of the uh, of the late Republic with greed, avarice being sort of the uh, the new uh, the new rights, the new virtues, of course, Cato stands in, you know, uh, defending the real uh, soul of the Republic and all the sort of principles that uh, defend you know we're, we're, we're there um for it so i think that's kato is more probably more than a politically important character is effectively valid for this uh, sort of moral standing and for actually how the literature after portrayed him uh, I, I don't know if that replies to your question uh, sorry i, I can't hear yes, you um, it's me okay <laughs> sorry, it's yeah uh, <laughs> yes very, very helpful um because i'll in our course, there are three key individuals who we study, Caesar, mm -hmm. Cicero, Cato. And in the reading I've been doing, uh, you read a lot about Cicero, Caesar, Pompey, Crassus, and mm -hmm. others, but Cato doesn't get mentioned that much. So what you've been saying about his symbolic value is, is really helpful. Um, yeah, um, I'm thinking of something you might read about it, uh, because this is all like the fruit of basically many readings I've di I did about the later perception of Cato. So um, I might uh, I might get back to you maybe with a more clear idea of what bibliography you might need in case, because uh, right now at the top of my head, I don't have much uh, as in, I have like a few things that maybe it's just too much right now, but um, you know, I can, I'll, I'll ask Paul to be the intermediate here in case. Yeah, that would be great, thank you. All right. Yes, I, I have another question. Yeah, please, <laughs> no, please, please, absolutely. Uh, well, um, my understanding was you were, you were taking us through Varro and uh, Florus and um, these other ancient writers, but um, my impression was that modern modern historians are a bit sort of snooty about ancient historians, thinking that they're, they're not real historians, they haven't had the right training, they don't understand economic history. Um, is, is, not that, is that not the case? Um, do, <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, I of course I, I have a more philological approach in the sense that uh, I'm not I'm not an historian. I would never call myself that, as in like I don't have the, the knowledge for that. But um, uh, as a as a student of mostly text, I would say that of course it it's always we always have to pay attention to what we are we're looking at, and of course we we should apply a, a sort of more um, you know well. 
uh, rational glance at it and really questioning the sources, uh, um, as you said. And uh, the thing is, I would say that, of course, the, the, the trouble with the Republican period is a lot of what comes to us is basically uh, what literary works that, of course, usually, uh, you know, poetic license and, and all of that intervenes in it. So uh, it, it's difficult for us to understand what really went on then. But in the case of, well, um, Flores and Appian, well, in the case, I might start actually better from Appian and Valerius Patekulis, although they are later historians, we know that from what they say and from comparing the sources, we can see that really they probably uh, had the same source, which is a Republican author, Azinius Polio, who unfortunately, again, is it could be it could be amazing if we had something from him. Uh, the trouble is we only have fragments. He was a contemporary of Horace of uh, Cicero. He lived in that sort of final span of the period. Um, but the trouble is that it wasn't. Nothing has remained. He wrote a whole history that probably continued Sallust's work uh, and went on. Uh, to uh, Caesar and Pompey's conflict. So of course it would be amazing to have that. Probably we, uh, people understand that Appian and Valerius probably had the same source. And of course, as we look also basically at Varro and Florus using the same sentences, of course we can imagine that, you know, the sources were probably the same. And uh, we, I guess it's more a work of comparing the text and see what they say and if it, you know, if it matches. Um, and uh, and yeah, that's um, that's it. I guess the uh, the the reply to the question, I would say, it's um, of course, yeah, ancient historians. We, we don't, we can't really say to what extent uh, we can trust them. Of course, sometimes it's the only thing we have. So uh, you know, it's just with a pinch of salt, I would say, you just you you can go for it, but. Um, at least like in this, I, I would say like, and this is also a bit to sum up because I know that we're short of time. So basically when we look at these texts, I think also the aim of my presentation, uh, thank you Giles, <laughs> um, the aim of, of, of my presentation was to look at the, um, how also Romans themselves reflected upon their own history and their own contemporary events, which I think it's something uh, that is useful to present to students also uh, to show what actually classics can teach us, which is something uh, about, you know, the ability of reflect on what is what we are going through, what is happening to us in our world and be able to form critical opinions about about it and not just standing there, letting things happen. So um, I guess that's also uh, why I sort of chose mostly well, Wiseman and the authors that Wiseman quotes because they, they show properly this characteristic of Roman culture. So um, I don't know if uh, Paul wants to take over right now, but thank you everyone uh, and for, for the interest you've shown. So it was really, really helpful and, and interesting.